Wonderful to have you all here tonight. Um, we've got a very challenging topic. I'm going to hit you with all sorts of science uh, in its most it's interdisciplinary form from all around the world. Lessons I've learned, challenges I've learned, and um, you know I've given earthquake talks around the world now to um, governments, as Mike said, in in Manila, in the Philippines, and in Thailand, and in Munich, and in uh, Italy. And I was interested, you know, I, I wanted to try to maximize the audience in terms of self-improvement. So I asked my undergraduate students, I said, what, what do you reckon I should do to try to sell the talk to the audience to sort of spice it up or whatever? And they asked me what was going to happen. I said, oh, you know, I'm going to give a talk and there's going to be a movie and there's going to be some pizza. And they said, hang on, there's going to be pizza. And I said, yeah, there's going to be some pizza. And they said, okay, well, maybe what you want to do is uh, change the title to free pizza and the science of earthquakes. So that's, that's the refined title for tonight. But the focus will not be on pizza, it will primarily be on earth, earthquakes. Um, I'm amazed by the power of earthquakes and, and the beauty of earthquakes, and this is a photograph I took shortly after the 2010 Darfield earthquake in New Zealand, in the South Island. And um, what I love so much about this photo is not only that there's um, beautiful patterns of surface rupture here, as you see by the crop rows and all that sort of stuff, but in, in classic uh, quintessential New Zealand form, there are two sheep that posed for the photograph, so we have something for scale there. And the power of the earthquake is recorded basically in, in how that land shifted in that earthquake. So I was wandering around telling people if they lived north of the fault rupture, you actually moved a meter and a half closer in an instant to Christchurch. And it's not something you would notice in your commute, of course, but it's definitely a permanent land change. And uh, the people on the south side of the fault, well, they moved a meter and a half closer to Melbourne, which is about, I looked it up actually, and Google's so useful for these sort of things. So sheep length is about 1.3 meters, an adult sheep. So um, we have a sheep metric for measuring the displacement there as well. Okay, so global earthquakes, a challenge, right? We take it on, we live in an interplate setting. Um, we have a responsibility to try to learn as much as we can, not only domestically, but also to provide to our international uh, friends. Uh, global earthquake fatalities are significant. In fact, actually, if we look at natural disasters, the death of natural disasters, by the way, I thought I was going to have a much bigger projection screen, so actually, if your the vision's a challenge for you, I'm, I'll do my best to read things out if they look blurry. 55% uh, of natural disaster deaths are, are caused by earthquakes and related phenomena, so tsunamis and so on. So in, this, in the period since 1994 to 2013, we had 750,000 deaths. Um, around the world from those phenomena. And when we compare them to other things like freezing cold temperatures, uh, floods, and so on, earthquakes um, win, that, um, win that challenge. Uh, the question is, is the worst yet to come? And if we look at the rate in which global population is increasing through time, this is this graph here, you can see uh, that we are surging and surging in our global population, but we are also surging and continuing to accumulate fatalities in our earthquakes. So this, the, 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 orange, the open circles, if you can see them there, are global fatalities from 1900 to 2011, and the black from 1968 to 2011. So fatalities are increasing and continue to increase. If we want to look at how many people die on average as a function of our population in earthquakes, we can do it as, as so. So I have earthquake deaths, the red bars here, in thousands per decade. And you can see that actually in terms of earthquake fatalities, the period between 2000 and 2010 was our most expensive in terms of fatalities, uh, total fatalities. But another way to do that is to look at that, is to normalize that as a function of global population. And so the black bars that we can see here are basically looking at sort of per capita earthquake deaths as a function of a million per million people on our, on our planet. And you can see that you could draw a straight line sort of horizontal line through that. So despite the amazing advances that we've made in science over this time period and in engineering, it seems that this, we're still having roughly the same number of people die in earthquakes in a decadal bin, although there's lots of variability, of course, within any one decade. When we look at seismicity and we look at death tolls and we want to predict how many people are going to die in the future from earthquakes, um, we predict, on average, around 2.57 million people will die in the 21st century from earthquakes. And as this century goes on, we'll see that it will be often moderate to large size events that, can, that accumulate in death tolls of hundreds of thousands and possibly even more. 
um, there are a variety of places where we think that will happen. This great question. Um, is science and engineering translating into fewer earthquake fatalities? If we look at the number of deaths per earthquake as a function of earthquake magnitude on this plot here, we can see a whole bunch of notorious events on there with very high death tolls. We know that it's not just the magnitude of the earthquake that controls how many people die, of course, because we have, often have earthquakes in very remote places where most of the seismic energy is absorbed in the crust before it actually arrives to major population centers. Um, we see massive variations in, for instance, these moderate magnitude earthquakes, magnitude 7. Haiti topping right up there at something like 230,000 uh, people dying in that one earthquake. Um, but you'll notice that a number of these colored dots, these recent dots, these notorious dots, are actually earthquakes that have happened relatively recently. So the Sumatra event, of course, how can we forget that with the giant tsunami? And um, Tohoku in Japan, again, Nepal here, uh, Chile. Several of these recent events have actually, um, well, some of these, several of these events are quite recent. The other thing is that a lot of them, the uh, pink and the green dots, are earthquakes that are sourced from faults that we didn't know about beforehand. So so-called surprises. We expect Japan and the subduction zone is going to get very large earthquakes, and it does. But there are a lot of other places around the planet where earthquakes seem to be somewhat of a surprise for us. And there's no way, despite our best efforts, efforts that we'll be able to map every active fault on the planet. A lot of people say, oh, this seem to be having more earthquakes. It just seems to be more earthquakes in the last little while. We seem to hear about them a lot more. seem to have large amounts of death tolls. So there's a variety of different ways of looking at that problem. Uh, one is to look at, have the earthquake magnitudes gotten bigger in the last decade or so compared to previous? And so each one of these bars with a little red dot on the top here shows an earthquake. And this is the, these are the largest, these are the sort of giant earthquakes in this scale. And you can see that there's this kind of up and down sort of um, random distribution of these earthquakes through time. We have some decades like in between 1950 and the early 60s where we seem to have a cluster of really giant earthquakes. And then we have other periods where we actually, like in the before the 30s, where we didn't seem to have a lot of really big earthquakes. So there's this kind of pattern of surges in giant earthquakes and, and, and then up periods of of a relative scarcity of these events. The other thing that you'll notice in this is the number of events in that magnitude band. And there's some times where we seem to have a real cluster of a whole bunch of events, and then other periods of time where we seem to go a year or so, or even longer, without having any magnitude um, 7 earthquakes. On average, the planet gets a 1 magnitude 8 uh, every year, and about 10 magnitude 7s every year. But there are some times where we actually have a relative scarcity of those events, and other times we, we, um, we have more of them. So there's this, there's this randomness that people have looked at statistically and tried to argue, uh, are we getting more or less than we have? And actually, if we look at a, at a good century full of, of earthquakes, it's not particularly anomalous in the last decade compared to decades previously, given that there's a lot of, um, a lot of noise in that signal. This just gives you an example of some of the big earthquakes we've had. The largest, the Chile earthquake, magnitude 9.5, uh, again in this cluster of events around the 1960s, and then some other ones, some more recent ones. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a challenging time for earthquake scientists. There's been a lot of media, there's been a lot of pressure. Um, probably most people in the room are familiar with the L'Aquila earthquake, earthquake case, where seismologists, uh, expert, uh, earthquake experts, were initially charged with manslaughter and then eventually acquitted through, um, through the uh, trials process. Um, there have been uh, issues like Tohoku, where the, the size of the wave and the size of the earthquake were larger than what was predicted in the Japan seismic hazard maps. And then there is this example of these earthquakes that constantly seem to surprise to come out of nowhere uh, and rupture in our major earthquake center. So it's prompted to think about how we not only estimate and do our science, but also how we communicate our science to the general audience. And the basic principle of, of it is, is largely this. We have something called seismic risk. Right? The risk could be a risk of dying in earthquakes. It could be an economic risk. It could be a, a risk to infrastructure, uh, lifelines, all these sorts of things. But there is a risk. And to calculate that risk, we want to understand the hazard. We want to under understand our exposure to the hazard. And then we want to understand our vulnerability. And this concept can sometimes be a little bit opaque to people, so I'm going to show it visually to you. Um, there are places in the world where we know 
they are just the perfect recipe for high hazard. Philippines is one of these places, giant subduction zones where the oceanic crust is diving beneath, um, di diving beneath the country, active volcanoes popping off all over the place, giant earthquakes, lots of earthquakes going on all throughout the Philippines. There is a very, very high hazard, and this red map shows the extreme shaking over a 50-year period. So we expect really strong shaking every 50 years on average in the Philippines for all these areas colored in the red, although sometimes we have clusters of really high energy. This gives you an example of exposure. So this is, a, this is a, an example uh, taken after the 2011 earthquakes in Christchurch, where people uh, were, we had, we had houses and things like that built right up into the edge of cliffs where giant rocks fall, fell off of the cliffs there. So we had examples where we, we actually, there was a, there was a hazard, and the, the land use planning allowed us to actually have more exposure to the po possible consequences of that hazard this example. And then there's a problem that's facing countries around the world, um, largely in developing nations, but um, often in other places as well. And that is this vulnerability, uh, where people in a lot of uh, countries in Southeast Asia, for instance, uh, instead of building houses out of um, bamboo and wood products, uh, we're making the shift towards concrete. Poor quality concrete, small little bricks, and when you see people building houses like this and putting big heavy roofs on them, and you know very well that if you pushed on the wall hard enough, you could knock it down, it gives you some idea about the problem that we face globally in this situation. So this is an example uh, where we have a high vulnerability to earthquake shake. Now, in, in Australia, we tend to think of our hazard as being relatively low. Uh, we don't have a lot of earthquakes, a lot of large earthquakes compared to plate boundary areas. Our exposure to them is relatively low. We don't live right on top of an uh, active plate boundary. But our vulnerability in terms of some of our structures can be perceived to be quite high. This is, gives you an example of, of a high vulnerability in terms of damage that was caused by the 1989 Newcastle earthquake, magnitude 5.6, where we had unreinforced masonry collapse in a lot of these sort of places. Okay? You don't necessarily have to be uh, a rocket science to wander around Melbourne. Uh, you can do it. Uh, on your own, or you can do it on Google Street View, as I've done here, to see that there are a lot of buildings in Melbourne that actually do have a high vulnerability to earthquake shaking. This is just one example. I can't have it on there for too long because my um, wife's father works for Nelson Alexander. But um, these are what we call soft stories, and the building's not very well supported. It's got very narrow columns underneath it. And these buildings we know from time and time again do not perform well. Hopefully nobody lives in this particular building. These buildings do not, live, do not perform very well in earthquakes. They're not very strong on the base level. They tend to collapse in pancake and so on. Okay, so then we have other examples. We have places like Japan where the opposite is the case. We have very high hazard. We know there's a high hazard. We know there's giant faults everywhere. We know there's lots of earthquakes. We have very high exposure. This particular photo is taken uh, just close to the east coast where we know tsunamis and strong shaking are a regular occurrence. But this particular building, this hospital here, actually is a nice example of a lower vulnerability, a reduced vulnerability. Not only can it stand up to very strong shaking, but it also provides a vertical evacuation point for the tsunami. And some of that awful and horrible uh, in, in spectacular footage that you've all seen on YouTube or whatever of these giant tsunami waves rolling across the landscape were taken from people that were up on the top of this building with their cameras and so on. So we talk about vertical evacuation in coastal areas as one way to perhaps through, uh, through engineering high enough, strong enough of reducing our vulnerability. The riskiest recipe is places in the world where we have high hazard, high exposure, and high vulnerability. And there are lots of these around the world. Places like Iran, this is Bam, Iran. 40,000 people died there. The city re reduced to rubble. Uh, Port-au-Prince in Haiti, more than 200,000 fatalities. And you can see these places are built on active faults. They have high hazard, they're highly exposed, and they have high vulnerability. We also, when we think about future vulnerabilities, there are places on our watch list. And places like Tehran, which has grown from a village to a city to a metropolis, we know we have what we call the legacy issue in terms of vulnerability, meaning buildings that were built in the past and not retrofitted up to modern codes. And some of us think that in Tehran, if they get a really massive earthquake, we might have the potential for a million earthquake deaths in an earthquake. So it's one of these cities that's on the high vulnerability list. And then we have places like Istanbul, where we've increased the exposure as a result of growth. And these 
lines that might look quite, quite tiny to you here show the difference in the urban area of Istanbul from 1950 compared to 2010. And you can see it growing and growing, the exposure growing, more and more people living close to or on top of active faults and so on. Um, the projected growth to 225, um, approaching 18 to 20 million people, highly exposed and, and often quite vulnerable to the effects of earthquake shaking. Now, I get a lot of people saying, oh, I hate earthquakes. I don't want to go to any place that gets earthquakes, but I am going to Tokyo. But what I'm going to make sure I do in Tokyo is stay in a really low building. And because I just, I can't believe these tall buildings. I can't believe they let them. I can't believe they let them build these tall buildings in, in Tokyo. And so I don't always carry this around with me to demonstrate this concept. <laughs> However, I think it's really, really insightful to look at this. So, when an earthquake occurs, it sends out seismic waves of all different frequencies and energies, and they radiate out, out through the Earth. And when we think about our vulnerability we, in, our, in, our, in our built environment, we might have a whole range of buildings of different stiffnesses and different heights and so on. And so I say to my students, if there was a big earthquake to occur, what sort of building would you want to be in? Would you want to be in the high rise, or would you rather be in something that was quite low? And they always say, I want to be in something that's low as possible. And I say, what if... What if the earthquake is coming along like this? And you can see, it's quite, quite a sound effect as well. You can see that some of the lower buildings are actually the ones doing the most of the shaking there. And the tall ones here are actually relatively firm and staying strong. And then if we have an earthquake that is a larger one with lots of low frequency energy, we can really get these big ones moving around. The other one's doing something different. The one thing you'll notice here is also is that these lower buildings here, one of them has a thinner, thinner bar compared to the other one. So this building's a little bit stiffer. And I'm actually having a little bit of challenge at the moment on this table doing this. But if you do it, oh, there we go. <laughs> you can actually get this one to resonate differently. So the height of the building and what the building's made out in some way controls how it behaves in an earthquake. And different buildings at different heights can actually behave in different ways in the earth. And sometimes they can even hit into each other if they're tall enough. When we think about, um, when we think about this in the context of some of our observations, we can actually see in Christchurch where we had a lot of high frequency energy in one of the events, all the roof tiles just blew off, just burst off of some of the really low um, buildings. And so there was a lot of high frequency energy in that earthquake as well as vertical accelerations that did that. Um, in the context of um, Tohoku, I think we're all, we have, we have this sort of ability to be citizen seismologists now. We can use Google Earth historical imagery. It's all at our finger, fingertips. And we can go and see the effects of earthquakes. And so this is an image taken before the tsunami of a coastal city. And you'll see several things. You'll see some uh, storm barriers there. And there were some um, tsunami wave walls that have been built there to try to protect from the waves washing over. And, I mean, this photo is just incredibly dramatic. When you look at uh, an image taken after the tsunami, and you can pinpoint exactly the, the damage patterns and so on. And there are a variety of things that made that event such a disaster, but certainly it's very poignant when you look at this image, how dramatically it's changed. The bottom line was that a lot of, in a lot of places, the, wave, the walls that were put up were just not high enough. And actually, they were scientifically informed. So the, width, the wall heights were based on X estimates for the maximum magnitude that we thought earthquakes could be on, on offshore there, and of some sophisticated modeling. They were built to that height, and the um, earthquake was larger than was predicted by the maps, and the wave was higher than predicted, and it washed over the walls. Okay, now back to a more regional context. I know we've got some Kiwis in the audience as well. And so I want to highlight what I consider to be the next great trans-Tasman rivalry. This will possibly replace rugby. Um, and this is this seismic risk uh, paradigm, or this seismic risk rivalry. So what I'm showing here are uh, earthquakes across the Australian continent um, going all the way back into the late 1800s and a decade of earthquakes, shallow earthquakes in New Zealand. You can see it almost blankets New Zealand in that 10-year period compared to the um, more than a century of earthquakes in Australia. So in general, 
the Kiwis are winning this seismicity rate race by about 10 to 1. Okay, so 10, 10 to 1 in terms of the earth, earthquakes in any given magnitude band. However, and this is something that I study, so I'm, I'm keeping close tabs on this one. As of um, earlier this year, it's 10 to 8 in terms of historical surface ruptures. So this is when the earthquakes are big enough to actually break through to the surface. We've had eight of these across Australia and 10 in New Zealand. And the latest one is actually, um, we have one of my colleagues right here studying this, 2016 in May, May this year. Australian quakes are felt over larger distances because the crust is stronger. So the seismic energy travels further and they're more intensely felt as a result of that. We've had 15 or more earthquakes since 1890 that are similar in magnitude to the 2011 uh, Christchurch earthquake. And I think that's particularly interesting because when I look at this image here of Australia, I think about it like a dartboard. Australia is uh, a very um, sparsely populated continental mass at large. We're so urbanized and we have all our population in these, these cities sprinkled along the coasts and virtually nothing in the middle, almost nothing in the middle. And it's sort of like this, every 10 years, it's like throwing a dart. And if you're like me, and you have virtually no accuracy with your dart throwing, it's, you would hope it would hit the board somewhere, but you really don't know where it's going to go. And um, if you look at those magnitude sixes in this area here, they're often in places that are very um, sparsely populated. And so they get felt in, in Tennant Creek or in, um, in Ayers Rock or Uluru, sorry, or these sort of areas, but they don't get felt major in, the, in the major cities. But there's absolutely no reason, geologically, that we couldn't get one of these events right underneath Melbourne, right underneath Adelaide, right underneath Perth, even. So we have uh, a risk, and we possibly have, in some places, a heightened vulnerability because of the standards of some of our buildings in that context. Okay, so I'm going to move on now to talking about these different things, these hazards, these exposures, these vulnerabilities, and I'm just going to show you some what I I've consider to be extraordinary images that we've been able to collect over the last um, little while of studying earthquakes and really talk to you about how we understand earthquakes. And I think I want to start old school. I want to start with what I think is the first family photo of an earthquake surface rupture. And this is, this is in New Zealand, so in North Canterbury. And this is a guy named William McKay, and he's the son of a geologist. And if you're a son of a geologist, Mike, as you know, you often get asked to stand beside things as a scale. So go stand beside the rock, so I'm going to take a photo of you. So, so I imagine this is the first family photo. Alex is telling um, Bill, go, go, go on, son, stand beside the fence. So the fence is actually being broken apart by this earthquake. And it was the, probably the first, the first photographic evidence for a strike-slip motion in earthquake. The fence used to be straight. It's now displaced. Um, and nowadays when we take... <laughs> Nowadays, when we take photographs of people on fault ruptures and so on, they're not quite as glamorous. They don't have quite the charm that uh, some of the initial photos had. This is a photo I took in Christchurch in the wee hours of um, September 4th, 2010. You can see in the background here this beautiful example of a rupture going through the landscape and displacing this, this hedge that used to be straight. And we actually understand this process rather well. Right? We know that... Uh, tectonic place, plate motions, number two, cause the movement of rocks around the crust. They cause uh, the, the rocks to move differentially across what, lock, what is a locked fault. And eventually, when the, strength, when the stresses get high enough along the fault, it ruptures in an earthquake. It sends seismic waves out, and we have displaced features at the end. We call this a seismic cycle. And unfortunately for us, nature doesn't always behave exactly the way we would like it to. But... This is just a schematic example of what we would refer to as a seismic cycle. So if we think about this as a failure stress here and a residual stress at the end, in this uh, inter-seismic period between earthquakes, so in the number two here, we have the stresses increasing, increasing up against the fault until eventually they reach a, pay, a, a, a state where they overcome the frictional strength of the fault and the fault ruptures. We call that the stress drop, and then the cycle begins again. And if Earth was perfect, then there would be a periodicity to the model, 
every 300 years or every 5,000 years, you'd get an earthquake of a set magnitude on a set fault, and we could just predict them, and it would be wonderful, and everything would be good. But we know from studying faults that sometimes they rupture, rupture earlier than we thought they were going to. Sometimes they have a whole bunch of smaller earthquakes before they rupture. Sometimes they don't slip as much as we thought they would. Sometimes the stress in between them changes, the, the moves the earthquake further towards or further away from us in time. Sometimes they get loaded up by earthquakes on other faults. And sometimes instead of just having one big stress drop, they, they rupture versus a whole chaotic series of smaller earthquakes. So, um, this is a damning observation for earthquake prediction, unfortunately, when we study these things. How do we measure this? How do we know? How do we know the plates are moving? How do we know anything about this interseismic cycle? We study this, this aspect here, what we call the loading rate, largely through GPS um, and geodetic surveys. So in a place like New Zealand, for instance, which is deforming so incredibly rapidly, we can actually say that people in Christchurch living here are getting about three centimeters per year closer to Melbourne every year as a result of this plate motion. All right? And, and people that live up in this part of New Zealand, well, they're actually on the same tectonic plate as Australia. They're moving, they're moving with Melbourne in the same direction, about seven centimeters per year to the north-northeast. So we can measure these rates. We have some idea about how things are being loaded up. And where the gradients are very, very high, where you go from having large arrows, lots of movement, to virtually having nothing, that's where we really define in the most active parts of our plate boundary. And we can make these deformation maps that show, these heat maps, which show which parts of the continents are deforming more than others, and especially in plate boundaries. This works very well. So the red area here shows the, the hottest and most dangerous part of New Zealand in terms of the um, rate of movement. And when we go there, as geologists, of course, we're not always so fascinated by looking for little geodetic markers. What can we see in the landscape? And actually, you can stand in one side on the Pacific plate, uh, and you'd be on the same plate as Hawaii, for instance, and feel quite good about that. And then you can look across and see the mountains on the other side of the plate boundary. And sometimes we can have our students stand with their feet on one plate and the other in this sort of environment and look across. So this is an example of the mountain building process going on on the plate boundary. I get asked about earthquake triggering a lot. So now we're talking about that part after the faults have been loaded up. What pushes them over the edge? What actually triggers the earthquake? And it seems like just about anything can trigger an earthquake these days. We get all sorts of media about this. But actually, um, there are a lot of processes that can push a fault that once it's loaded up over the edge, which makes prediction so hard. So this little cartoon that I've got here shows a variety of different ways in which an earthquake can trigger another. So for instance, here you have a large fault plane, this A here, which actually causes a big stress perturbation. It shifts the crust and triggers an earthquake on fault B as a result of that change in stress. But it also sends out seismic waves, which shake that fault zone around and cause an earthquake on that fault zone there. They can come from that fault close by, or they can also travel around the planet. For instance, sometimes we see triggered earthquakes thousands of kilometers away from the event that actually um, preceded them. Um, we think that fluids can migrate up into fault planes, weaken them, and cause, cause them to failure, cause them to fail. Um, we know, for instance, that uh, the Earth changes its shape as the moon moves around it, we call them the solid earth tides, and these could, in theory, relax and increase stresses on fault zones. We know that we have tidally triggered earthquakes in some places, where the oceans retreat, we have some unloading. Uh, we have uh, earthquakes related to deglaciation. We have earthquakes related to volcanoes and magma ascent. We have earthquakes related to dam loading and increasing pore fluid pressures down through the rocks. We have earthquakes related to mining excavations. We have earthquakes related to the withdrawal and the insertion of fluids into our crust. And so we can see this in the peer-reviewed literature, things about global aftershock zones, tidal triggering, and so on. But what we're often most concerned about, it seems, in today's climate is what are we doing to the crust to increase or influence the seismicity? And we do things that we actually, for the very purpose of inducing small earthquakes, called fracking, but we also do things by, like injecting deep wastewaters into fault zones. And I think that this, it's the latter case which is perhaps dangerous in terms of uh, influencing seismic hazard. So how this might work is you inject fluids down into the crust, 
into a reservoir, but if that reservoir is permeable, it's possible the fluids might circulate along there, eventually interact with a fault, and, and push it closer to failure, allow it to, failure, allow it to fail by reducing the, um, the, sh the stress on the fault zone. Um, we also have the potential by adding or withdrawing fluids around the crust to influence the stress state on the actual fault. And so that's something we also worry about in the context of seismicity. And there have been some earthquakes recently where people have argued that aspects of that earthquake, large damaging, even fatal earthquakes, aspects of that were potentially influenced by human, um, human uh, processes like groundwater withdrawal. If we look at, area, at areas where we're injecting wastewater into the crust, this is an example of the south, southeast um, United States here. And this gives you an earthquake rate, a long-term earthquake rate over these decades beforehand. And then after the practice of opening up more wells and injecting um, deep, deep um, briny fluids deeper into the faults, you can see an increase in the rate of earthquakes. You can see that red line ramp up a little bit compared to the rate at which it was before. Um, in some cases, people have even argued that injecting wastewater deep into, flu into rocks, the fluids have migrated and caused significant earthquakes like a magnitude 5.7 in 2011 in Oklahoma. Okay, so now we want to talk a little bit about the characterizing of the fault rupture process. And I, this is something that excites me tremendously because I think that we are on the cusp of major breakthroughs, but we also have all these data sets that we never used to have available to us. And we can measure the effects of earthquakes in unprecedented resolution. And it's, very, and it's quite exciting. But before we can go there, I need to make sure that we're up to speed with some of the, 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 the basics of what an earthquake actually looks like. And how this happens is, you basically have a fault. It might have an irregular shape like this here. The earthquake begins as a rupture patch. It might only be the size of this room. And it begins to break and crack along the fault plane. It propagates out in all directions. It might propagate largely in one direction more than the others, uh, or the, the earthquake might start right in the middle of the fault and propagate it out in both directions. The rate at which an earthquake rupture grows is about two to three kilometers per second. So the process happens very, very fast. And the faster it happens, the more it piles up seismic waves in front of it as it ruptures and releases them into the environment. The area on the surface above where the earthquake started we call the epicenter. And the epicenter may actually not be anywhere near where the surface rupture is or where the maximum slip is on, on the earthquake source. Now the most important thing for you to get from this cartoon that I've given you here is that the bigger the fault zone is and the more it slips, the larger the earthquake. And for an earthquake of a given magnitude and depth, the closer you are to it, the stronger the shaking. The further you are, uh, the less the shaking. Okay, so what happens? An earthquake occurs, and we have a dense network of seismometers around the world. And almost immediately, you get an email or a, tw or a, or a tweet or something that says to you, magnitude 6.5 in Ecuador, for example. Okay? And within hours now, there is a program that put out by the USGS which calculates expected numbers of fatalities from the earthquake, expected economic losses, the population exposure to the strong shaking, and even a model of how the slip occurred on the earthquake and the velocity at which it occurred. So we have this network of seismometers around the globe which enables us to do these very rapid calculations, which I think is a tremendously exciting uh, advance in this field. We can also map earthquakes from space. So yes, Big Brother is watching. The satellites that are circulating in our planet enable us not only to use radar data to actually measure changes in the shape of the Earth's surface before and after earthquakes, as I'm showing you in this rather colorful image here, and, the, and this image here. This is after a magnitude 6.1 earthquake in Uluru earlier in the year. And you can see that in this area here, this area was uplifted significantly and this area um, moved down. But we also have the ability of these satellites to use optical data. And so about a month after this earthquake, my mate from the USGS got in touch with me and said, hey, check this out. I just saw your earthquake and the outback. He got imagery for the outback image, for the, for the rupture. So it's pretty, pretty amazing. We can map earthquakes from aircraft, 
This is an example of a fault rupture here from New Zealand. And from tomorrow's research, we can map earthquakes from drones. So um, drones are not just used for spying on people anymore. They're actually really good at, turns out, at mapping earthquake ruptures. So uh, this is some drone imagery here. You can see these two little people down in here. And you can make out this semblance of an earthquake surface rupture. And I'll just color that in uh, roughly to show you what it looks like. This is an example of what it looks like on the map. Or, sorry, on the ground. Uh, mapping earthquakes on the ground is incredibly uh, rewarding. If there's a really beautiful rupture like this one, you can see displaced features. These are the, um, the tire tracks offset dextrally. We can use things like terrestrial LIDAR, LIDAR, laser scanning of the surface to create these beautiful images. And we can also map earthquakes in the jungle, in places where the forest is so dense you wouldn't even know how to go anywhere or you wouldn't know where you were. We can use LIDAR, this laser scan imagery, and basically deforest the landscape. And when we do that, we can actually find examples of major faults that rupture through that landscape and produce um, large earthquakes. Some examples of those there. And when we actually get down on the ground, then, after we find these uh, ruptures in the dense, dense bush, we can study the trees and work out when the earthquakes actually occurred from the tree rings. This is an example of some of the work we're doing in New Zealand in this context. It's also very important to map earthquake ruptures under the ground. And so how this typically works is when there's an earthquake rupture that we've either observed or even perhaps one that is historical, we go out there with a giant backhoe and dig a big hole across the fault like this. And then we fill the hole with a bunch of energetic uh, graduate students and tell them to map the hell out of it. And what they do is map all the gravel and all the cracks and all this sort of thing over weeks and weeks, and eventually we put together a story of how we think the earth, how we think this particular fault works and operates. So in this example here, what the students found was when they looked at one of the walls of the trench, they found this sandy bit of channel here that was faulted. And when they dug further, back in there they found that faulted channel again. So there's an element of this detective work looking in the geologic past for pre previous earthquakes. And so what was, what was the uh, conclusion out of this study was that sometime between 21 and 28,000 years ago, there was a, the penultimate earthquake on this particular fault. There was one earthquake in 2010. The last one was, say, 25,000 plus or minus a few thousand years ago, which is rather quite unfortunate if you built your house right on top of this fault uh, five years before the earthquake, as some people did, knowing that it just was so unlucky that this fault sat there for 25,000 years and then ruptured through your house on your watch. Pretty unlucky. This is an example of what that looks like. So the end game here is actually uh, we're trying to define faults. We want to give people good advice if they live close to faults. We want to define avoidance zones, areas where we don't think buildings should be uh, allowed or, we should, or it should be restricted in some form. And in some cases, we can actually inform mitigation. And this is one of my favorite paleoseismic stories. This was a fault that was studied by paleoseismologists like me in the ways I just showed you. They dug holes across it. And they said, this fault in Alaska uh, near Denali, this fault ruptures on average about 8 meters or so every event. We can see that in the geologic record. It's telling us. And the problem was we have the, this Alaskan oil pipeline that needs to go across the fault. So what do we do with this? We don't want the pipeline to rupture in the earthquake. That is not a good scenario. Pipelines don't do well when they're subject, subjected to eight meters of displacement. So what they did was put the pipeline on rollers on the ground. The rollers were affixed to the ground, and the pipeline was resting on them. And sure enough, there was a giant earthquake on that fault. The ground moved. The pipeline stayed where it was, and there was not a drop of oil spilled. So it's a fantastic story in that regard. In the context of Australia, we're also interested in how big earthquakes can actually get, right? And we do that by doing things like mapping faults like these ones here and also measuring displacements along these fossil earthquakes. They tell us that in some parts of Australia, we might even be able to get up to magnitude 7.9, which is not unprecedented for an intraplate region. But in general, we think they, they kind of top out around that 7.2 to 7.6 range for earthquakes. Our historical record is so short for an intraplate setting, so it shouldn't surprise us that we haven't had anything that big yet, but it's still something that we need to consider going forward. 
Okay, this is an amazing example of what we can do in places where we have earthquakes when we think about future hazard. And so this is uh, Christchurch in New Zealand. This is a pre-earthquake image, uh, a laser scan of the city, of the area, high resolution. And what I'm going to show you here is something called the sinking city. As a result of the earthquakes, Christchurch experienced a lot of liquefaction. It changed the ground in from a solid to a liquid state during the earthquake, and it subsided. And for a city to sink in a coastal region is quite a bad thing. So we were able to, after earthquakes, go out and do repeat aerial laser scans and track the slow, progressive sinking of the city. So this is an example of how the city performed as a result of the first earthquake, September 4th. You can see there's traces of areas. The red areas are the areas that are going down. And you can see there's traces of areas that have subsided up to half a meter in places in that first earthquake. But as the earthquake sequence went on, you could see the patterns getting more and more severe, largely around coastal areas. And by the time the sequence was largely finished in December, uh, lots of eastern Christchurch had subsided half a meter or more. And if you want to think about the perfect recipe for increasing flood hazard, both from coastal inundation and from the, the, uh, the, ur in the urban environment, urban streams, basically what was happening was the flood plains were sinking, the rivers themselves were filling up with sediment, so getting shallower, and they were getting narrow because the ground was basically oozing and spreading into one another. So as a result of this data and some other data, it was concluded that a lot of these places were no longer fit to live in. And so we had um, some retreat from those areas that I'll show you in a moment. This is an example that Mike alluded to earlier. This is the best record ever of recurrent liquefaction, and this is from my, where the house I was living in at the time. So the reason I say it's the best globally is because we were actually in the house, and every time there was, an, there was an earthquake, I'd go out and see whether it did anything or not. And some of these events actually were rather small and might have gone missed, and other than, uh, some of the other ones were only an hour apart. So we call this the Avonside Liquefaction Laboratory. Um, it's no longer there, um, but it was a really good scientific example. The people in Christchurch loved the idea of me and my um, PhD student digging up my yard, to look at evidence for paleoliquefaction, um, and this in part informed some of the land use policy decisions that were made in Christchurch. And in the biggest picture, I think it's, it's such a fascinating uh, thing to think about. This is an example of Christchurch looking east towards the Pacific Ocean, of what we are going to do as a community, as a society going forward, um, as ocean levels increase. Christchurch gives us an example of basically two centuries of projected sea level rise in an instant because the ground sunk so much. Um, and so really we're trying to use geology to reduce our exposure via land use planning and reduce our vulnerability by making lifelines and buildings more resilient to earthquakes. And so if you again go, you go on historical view on Google Earth, you can see just how much Christchurch has changed as a result of the science that has contributed to this process. So this is from 2012. Some of the photos I showed you were from this area here. And this is what Christchurch looks like now. Large areas have actually been purchased by the government and turned into parkland for the foreseeable future. We're interested in also understanding whether we're making things worse inadvertently in some places on the planet. So uh, in the Christchurch earthquake, we had lots of large boulders like these come down from slopes hundreds of meters above go through houses, right through the middle of this house here, and come to their resting place. We dated rocks from the past to look at the frequency of these. We modeled their trajectories of the boulders, and we provide that information for consideration of future hazard. One of the most interesting things that we learned was that all of the ancient rocks that came down from that same landscape did not travel as far as the ones that came down in 2011 in the Christchurch earthquake. So we have this, uh, we have this uh, saying in geology that the past is the key to the future, and the key to the present. And in this case, actually, it was the human deforestation of the landscape removed the trees. And therefore, the boulders traveled further than they ever had before when there was a native um, vegetation there, uh, which was uh, an incredible example of how we perhaps are changing our exposure, our hazard in some cases. A final few points, we're now in the stage where we're actually forecasting earthquakes like we forecast the weather. 
So this is uh, an example of Christchurch before, in the decade before the, uh, the Christchurch earthquakes. And this is how that picture, each one of those pink dots is a magnitude 3. This is how that picture changed so dramatically. But during that sequence, um, there were models being released, released that showed the redistribution of stresses around Christchurch. And some of the earliest models that were published quite early in the piece showed the red areas, the areas of higher expected uh, earthquake frequency as a result of changing in the stresses. And it turns out when you look retrospectively at this, that a lot of those yellow dots um, are actually in those red zones. In fact, most of them are. Um, so we have these, these, these stress models, and we also were releasing models that actually said, this is your chance, your probability of experiencing strong shaking today or in the next week, or in the next month, or in the next year. So it, it, science has progressed to that stage. OK, some concluding points. Something I've learned that's very, very important. Virtually every contemporary earthquake has a historic or a prehistoric predecessor of equivalent or greater extent. So we need to be able to use the geolog geologic record to forecast the location and the severity of future earthquakes, to define, to define areas we should avoid, to help us make building cards uh, and, and come up with good solutions and with a global perspective of trying to reduce our risk. Earthquake science is being conducted with increasing precision, speed and accuracy. Within 24 hours to 48 hours, we're coming up with int incredible amounts of scientific data. We can forecast earthquakes quite accurately in some cases. We can map likely sources of future earthquakes quite well. We can even outrace earthquakes. We have the technology that when an earthquake occurs over here, we can give an alarm over here saying strong shaking expected in 10 seconds. So we have this kind of science. But we can still not predict accurately, go out of town this weekend, there's going to be a magnitude 6 underneath your house. And we may never get there. Reducing seismic risk is in a very interdisciplinary endeavor. Earthquake science plays only a small role in this. We interact with politicians, with engineers, land use planners, etc., etc. Uh, it's a very, very big challenge, as I've highlighted to you tonight. In countries like Australia, uh, earthquake science should contribute to major domestic projects uh, and policy deba debates. We can see places around Australia where dams have been constructed right by active faults. Uh, probably the faults were unknown in a lot of examples. Is that a good thing or is it a bad thing? How do we handle that? Um, and certainly on the recent agenda, issues like nuclear waste storage. Seismic has, has a role to play there. We also have a role in the global community to try to uh, foster out some of our, of our lessons that we've learned to try to make the world a safer place. Thank you very much.